another great webinar, a DevOps-related webinar, and thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to get started in just about a minute with our speakers, but I wanted to take the first minute or two to briefly go over your GoToWebinar control panel for those of you who have never joined us on our DevOps.com webinars. Hopefully you're all seeing the GoToWebinar control panel probably in the right-hand corner of your screen. And there are uh, two or three specific areas that I want to call to your uh, attention. One is the questions section, and if you tap the little carrot or pointer next to questions, it should open for you. What we're doing here is we set aside time at the end of today's presentation for audience participation and questions. Rather than waiting till the end to type your question in, we've made it possible, you, possible for you to type your question in real time and it will be queued and ready for us at the appropriate time. This way you don't have to worry about forgetting your question or uh, what order and, and so forth. <clears throat> so please feel free to type questions in real time as they pop into your head and we'll, we'll, it'll be saved here. If we, the other nice thing about using this is if we can't get to them today, we do have a record of them and we can respond in writing offline. I know the most prevalent question is always, are these slides going to be available? Yes, we are recording today's webinar. The slides, the audio will be available on YouTube and on DevOps.com, usually within 24 to 48 hours. So you'll be able to get it there. Next, I wanted to uh, draw your attention to the chat session of our GoToWebinar control panel. The chat session is not meant to ask questions for our panelists. The chat session, though, section is great if you are experiencing some sort of technical difficulty such as your audio is not working or the slides aren't advancing or, or some other similar problem. We do have our uh, DevOps.com webinar engineers behind the scenes here monitoring. They will respond to your chats or your chat issues in chat and, and try to fix them for you. So if you need to contact us, chat's definitely the way to do it. We'll also be doing some polling questions today, and um, we will get to them at the appropriate time. But at this point, let's get started. And uh, today's webinar is sponsored by our friends at Everbridge, uh, IT alerting company, and we're very lucky to have two presenters uh, on behalf of for, for today's webinar. First, Mr. Vincent Jeffrey. Uh, Vincent is the Senior Director at Everbridge, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about himself. And secondly, but certainly not least, is a good friend of mine, my co-founder at the DevOps Institute, as well as the founder of the ITSM Academy, and I don't want to say how many years, but a long time uh, experienced person in the IT space. How about we do that? Jane Grohl. Vincent, Jane, welcome. Hi, Alan. Hi, Vincent. How's everyone? Vincent, are you here? You're here, yes? Hi, everybody. Perfect. This is Vincent. Okay, just, okay, that was our sound check. We sound good. Um, I've taken up one more minute than I wanted to, so I'm going to turn things right over if we can. Uh, Jane, if you want to take over. Yep, thanks Alan and, and hi Vincent. So I'm going to get us started and we're going to just talk a little bit about communication in a DevOps unplanned world. Uh, you know, many of you are now starting to have some experiences with DevOps and con continuous delivery and continuous integration and automated testing and all of that really has to do with when things go right. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, how IT has gotten to where we are today and how we can incorporate some types of communication improvements in order to help us go faster. So what we have here is a failure to communicate. So when dinosaurs walked the earth and the life before Agile and IT service management and DevOps was in place, as Alan said, I have a little bit more than a few years in IT without dating myself. Uh, but uh, again, if you go back to the earlier days of of IT, and by the way, those earlier days may be 15 years ago, so we're a pretty young industry still. Waterfall development was the norm. It was very, very sequential in IT as we started to grow up and technology became a part of business culture. We grew up in, in, in silos, and that's mostly because 
IT is an organization of specialists, and we start to look at the specialties and how we were organized from an HR perspective, those silos started to group those with specific types of subject matter expertise under the same line management. So part of that, the, the net result of that, part of that was frustration and communication where the silos really didn't communicate with each other. IT started to grow exponentially and collaboration between development teams and operations teams became less and less and less. And, and more importantly, you didn't know them, right? They were in different countries and they were in different supply organizations and you didn't pass them in the cafeteria as I did in my, in my early days. So the result of that is when we started to have unplanned events, whether they were poorly in implemented changes or there were leases that uh, didn't go quite as planned or there were just normal incidents, critical incidents to the organization, the escalations were either manual, we had to go find somebody, uh, whether that was phone calling or running or going to get them. Remember, dinosaurs are, are in our offices at the same time or we were using uh, fairly unsophisticated ticketing tools uh, to be able to, to reach out to those people and get them engaged. So MTTR was, de was delayed and the great divide grew greater. And so part of that uh, was an effort from both sides of the IT organization to improve. So starting probably within the last 10 years, Ops organizations started to pay more attention to IT service management, recognizing that uh, services were really the end outcome that, what the, that the customers wanted and that those services needed to be managed from a, an availability perspective, from a continuity capacity, and certainly from an incident and problem perspective. So frameworks like ITIL and IT service management management started to introduce some communication opportunities that would improve what had come before. And so IDLE very strongly advocated the creation of communication plans or RACI matrices. If, if you're not familiar with RACI, uh, it's a matrix that sets up who's responsible, accountable, consulted, or informed about a particular activity or a particular procedure so that you knew how to communicate and when to communicate to them depending on the role that they played. Service level agreements, operational level agreements started to become more prominent, were built into those SLAs or into those OLAs were response times, right? So if there was a major incident or a major event, there would be a P1, you might be familiar with that term, um, and the P1 would require a response within so many minutes and a, a, a resolution within other minutes as well. IDLE um, advocated the use of models so that you could look at incidents or changes or releases and build models based on the scope and risk of those incident changes or uh, releases or problems and organizations started to, to build those as well. And if you continue looking down the bullets, you'll see you know, we started to build stronger escalation paths and the ticketing systems started to become much more sophisticated and integrated with monitoring tools and, and other capabilities, beepers, if you remember when we carried beepers or, um, or you know, now they can, they can send you a text or, or, an, or an email or whatever. And so it became a little bit more sophisticated and the event management tools became sophisticated as well. The problem here is that dev mostly was not involved in the development of these types of communication options, right? So we didn't reach out to dev and say, hey, what would be the most efficient way to reach you and, and what about building you into this escalation path? It was done, uh, again, a little bit in a, silo, in a siloed approach. And so the result was that dev didn't really participate or get engaged. They did what they had to do but the delays that were associated with sometimes were more, ex more extensive than they needed to be. Now on the development side, about the same time, organizations started to pay some attention to agile software development. And again, if you know anything about agile and scrum, there are also improvement opportunities there as far as communications go. So agile advocates the use of scrum teams, more than three, less than nine, so that those scrum teams would be self-organizing, they would communicate with each other, they would have stand-ups and reviews and retrospectives and, 
and they would become such a unit that the communication within the team in terms of getting things done would be much, much greater. And there was planning, right? There was sprint planning and there were release planning and there were rules associated with how to do product and software development that kept that tight group of developers engaged and communicating with each other and really starting to build team dynamics. Events were time boxed so that there was a limitation in terms of, of how long and, and how deep those kinds of meetings would go and depending on the scope of the event, the time box could go from 15 minutes to a stand up to several hours to a planning session. And the net result of that were faster release, faster release um, cycles. Unfortunately, ops was not involved in this as well. So while development was engaging in agile software development, that became a unique vocabulary, it became a unique way of doing things, it became uh, something that uh, developers did, and the faster release cycles ran into some constraints when they started to transition into operations. So the use of agile methods grew, but friction between development and operations increased because ops was focusing on IT service management, dev was focusing on agile, and the two were not cross-pollinating not only their vocabulary and their practices, but they weren't cross-pollinating their communication. And so they really weren't speaking the same language, they weren't sharing the same communication platforms, and so at the end of the day there still were some extensive delays. And so now enter DevOps. And so over the last several years, uh, Zali mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders of the DevOps Institute. I've been in the DevOps community probably now for a little over three years. Um, and we've started to see the rapid, rapid growth of interest in DevOps. Um, and DevOps at its heart is a cultural and professional movement and it stresses communication and it stresses collaboration and it stresses integration between developers and operational professionals. And it's also encouraging the use of automation, particularly in the process of software delivery and infrastructure changes. So we have communication, we have collaboration, we have integration as really being the core uh, values that are embedded into DevOps and then we couple that with good automation to make sure that not only can we go faster but we can be more consistent. So in a planned world, DevOps is incredibly innovative, right? It, it allows us and encourages us to improve our IT culture and to get engaged in continuous integration where multiple developers are coding at the same time and committing their work to a a central server where it's built and tested together and we're looking at concepts like continuous delivery where um, software is always in a releasable cycle and it's staged and continuous testing, automated testing and, and doing all of the pre-work from a QA perspective that will lower the risk of failure when we enter into the production environment. And so tool chains are being built as part of continuous delivery. Again, many of you are probably familiar with this, where the tool chain is connected through, through APIs. And, and in order to collaborate and communicate better, we have chat up tools and we have collaborative tools. And you might be standing up a GoToMeeting like we're doing GoToWebinar right now, or you might be standing up other types of virtual integration between them. And we're encouraged to uh, shorten our feedback loops. If you've read the Phoenix Project, for example, that's one of the ways is, is, is to look at opportunities to increase the amount of feedback and to shorten the time within which that feedback is provided. And we're also encouraged to experiment and to learn and to take a few planned risks in terms of how we're going to move things into production faster to meet the rising demands of our business customers and go forward from, from there. So it's a faster flow from dev to ops. The goal is that dev and ops are both prepared for that. <coughs> Excuse me. That dev and ops are both prepared for that and that they start to cross-pollinate their knowledge. They start to engage each other. And in a very, very planned world, DevOps makes a lot of sense. So again, a lot of discussion. DevOps.com is a great resource for perspective on different aspects of, of DevOps. But what's often not discussed is um, the results and what happens when those results uh, gain us uh, some type of unplanned work.
So the great news is that organizations that have started to introduce DevOps practices are much more agile. They can ship code faster, they can complete their deployments much, much faster. And of course, faster is dependent on your organization's need to go faster. Right? You may not need to drop code 50 times a day, but you might need to increase from once a month to once a week. And that would be okay too. And organizations that have, are starting to really implement some of the emerging DevOps practices are seeing those results. What's equally important is that services are more reliable, right? 50% fewer failures. So even though we're experimenting and we're taking some risks and we're going faster, the results of the uh, state of DevOps surveys, this is 2013, but it's been validated uh, beyond that, is 50% fewer failures and services restored, MTTR, is 12 times faster. And that's great, right? That's great. Certainly we're starting to see a, a, a lot of very, very significant and tangible benefits coming out of DevOps. But what if this happens, right? What about DevOps in an unplanned world? And so, you know, a critical incident occurs and, and despite all our best efforts and all our good automated testing and everything that we're doing possibly to improve the collaboration and the flow and the communication between Dev and Ops, stuff happens. And so critical incidents may occur because a change didn't go as planned or a release needed to be backed out or something just went wrong. And it's during these times that DevOps processes and practices may be challenged, right? particularly in the speed of communication, because there are so many different resources that may be involved in your deployment. It may be a very small deployment, a few lines of code, it may be a very big deployment, but who is actually at the root of, of what's included in the deployment may be very, very wide. It may be your staff, it may be your suppliers, it may be your stakeholders. So the message here is that while we talk a lot about faster release cycles, we absolutely need to also require faster response cycles. Right? We can't go fast if we're in delivery if we're not capable and we have good communication opportunities to go fast when things go wrong. So in a typical crisis, our usual go-to actions are send an email, right? Send an email to everybody that we have a P1 incident that's occurred or we have a change or release that um, didn't go quite as planned or we'll set up a conference call um, in the idle world. We call it an emergency cab or an e-cab, so we'll call the emergency cab together. Or you might be invited to a chat ops or you might get an escalation notification from a monitoring uh, tool or from your ticketing incident problem management tool. You might actually do round robin calls to your stakeholders. And the worst case scenario is you may wait, right? Wait until uh, the communication has made it to the appropriate stakeholders so that you can hold the conference call or you can conduct the, the chat ups or you can take whatever actions, whether they're uh, diagnostic triage actions or they're actually resolution actions. The challenge is while all of these communication actions are very, very good, they're not necessarily a one size fits all because you don't know if your key contributors are available. You don't know if they're away from their desk. You don't know if they turned off their phone because they're doing a webinar. Or you don't know if they're on vacation. And you certainly don't know if they're sleeping, particularly when we have so many different time zones that are involved there. So while all of these go-to actions are, are solid, right? They're, they're tangible, good actions. They're not necessarily appropriate in every situation for every person. And sometimes you, you just don't know, right? You just, you, you, you can't take a guess whether somebody is available or, or not available, even with the best collaboration tools that we have today. So the message that I think needs to emerge, and, and you know, we use in DevOps this concept of emerging practice over best practice. So one of the concepts and practices that needs to emerge in DevOps is recognition that when things, that we need to go faster when things go right, but we also need to have process and procedures in place when things go wrong so that we can go equally fast and we can respond equally to the, the, the scope or severity of the situation. So a priority one situation um, certainly requires a drop everything and let's all pay attention to it. The problem is when, 
right? And how do you know? And who do you get in touch with? And, and what's that escalation plan? So it's also important to understand while we talk a lot about MTTR in the DevOps space, I mean, MTTR, mean time to, to restore service, mean time to re recover, mean time to resolve, depending on how you define what the R is, or MTBI, mean time between incidents, uh, some call that MTBF, mean time between failures. It's not as just a statistic. It's not something that we talk about five nines. It's not something that we should be uh, posting up on a whiteboard in an IT organization or on a virtual intranet. It's not a, just a statistic, and it's certainly not just an ops measurement. Right? It's something that be, below that, that data sits some information about response and recovery that's critical to your business. Your business does not want to look at MTTR, even though it's built into many, many of your SLAs, right? We're going to respond to a P1 in this period of time, and we're going to respond to a P2 in a, in a different period of time. It's not just a statistic. It's not just a metric. It says a lot about what's happening in your organization. It says a lot about business impact. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about five nines, and, and, and I'm old enough to know that, you know, there were, there were senior managers that would, you know, literally promote their five nines on a regular basis. The question is, you know, what about the, what about the time that you had the failure? When did it occur? What was the business impact? What was the cost to the business? So it isn't just that you keep the availability at a certain place. It's what's happening when that failure actually occurs. I've been hearing a lot, and Forrester has been promoting, among others, this concept of, of mean time to know or mean time to identify. Mean time to identify is when, it was, when an incident or some type of a failure was detected. Mean time to know is, is a metric that's looking at uh, mean time to know what the root cause is. So we're starting to not only measure mean time to recover, or mean time between incidents or failures, right? We're not only measuring now reliability, we're actually now starting to measure how long it took us to be able to identify, how long it took us to respond, how long it took us to identify what that root cause is. So time is now being measured in, in somewhat of a different way. Uh, because this MTTK, mean time to know, is very dependent on everything that came before it, particularly uh, you know, how long it took us to identify and communicate that something had happened, particularly in a critical situation. So if we couple DevOps values, right, collaboration, communication, integration, uh, we start to look at automation as key aspects of DevOps. And we combine that with perhaps more updated or agile incident change and release management processes. So they're um, not as sequential. They have a lot more agility. They have a lot more adaptability built into those processes, and then we add the extra ingredient of automated communication, critical incidents will be restored, resolved, uh, MTTI, MTTK, I can throw a lot of M's around, right? But, you know, all of these statistics will start to have really significant meaning because the processes will be adapted to be more agile. The values of DevOps will be embedded in those processes and automation won't be limited just to continuous delivery. Automation can be leveraged on communication platforms as well. And Vincent will speak a little bit more about going faster in the second part of this webinar. <coughs> right? Don't panic. Right? Talk to me. It's, it's the lost art, and, and if, if you're in any type of a situation uh, now dealing with a millennial or anyone younger than a millennial, um, we don't, they don't talk anyhow, right? <laughs> There's texting and emailing, and well, it's not even email anymore. It's text or, or chat or you know, other types of written communication. But the need to be able to talk, to communicate, to share um, has become as important as anything else that IT does today in order to ensure that continuous delivery and fast flow is, is appropriate and when things are unplanned, we're able to respond equally as well. 
So I just want to take a, a, a minute and talk about the need for automated communication. You know, uh, you know, the definition of DevOps very clearly calls out automation as a critical success factor for, for DevOps. And again, most of the time that's perceived to be some type of a tool chain associated with continuous delivery. But automation in and of itself, when done properly, actually increases your speed and your consistency, right? We build the rules into the automation. The automation will execute those rules depending on certain criteria over and over and over again um, in a very, very consistent way. Automation doesn't know how to panic, right? Human beings know how to panic. Automation doesn't know how to panic. And so therefore, because it's much more consistent and because the rules um, are authored in a way so that the automation knows how to perform, speed is increased as well. And as I just said, unfortunately in DevOps, sometimes when we talk about automation, we really focus in on the continuous integration, continuous delivery aspects of automation. We may extend that out to some configuration management tools or some operational tools that will help manage monitoring or uh, record keeping for incident problems, changes, and releases. But certainly when we look at automation um, and communication, that becomes important as well because the more we can automate the different options for communication so that we can reach those, those folks, right, MTTI, mean time to identify, we can decrease that, that opportunity uh, the, the more we have the, the time to be able to actually resolve the problem. Unfortunately, many think that communication is covered in various tools, and it's true that various tools do have communication aspects. Again, if you go into a, a, a ticketing tool or a record-keeping tool or an ITSM suite, um, there is escalation capabilities where it can launch an email or text or or uh, some other type of communication. In the old days, we used to have uh, the LED boards on the on you know on the the wall that would announce if there was a, a P1. Um, situation. So many of the tools do have communication capabilities. The problem is they're not aligned, they're not integrated, and they, they don't necessarily have the right rules or the, or the same rules built into all of them. So, you know, as I said, Dev and Ops have been operating in parallel. And so in parallel, they may have different communication techniques that are, are, are taking place. The better news, though, is there's been a lot of innovation in terms of automation. Automation uh, presents us so many different communication options and mobility has certainly contributed to that as well. So not only do we have now communication platforms that will integrate with several of the, the other automated capabilities, we also have a lot more mobility so how it reaches the intended stakeholder can be very, very flexible. Um, you know, if, if, if you try to reach somebody at 2 o'clock in the morning with an email, you're not going to succeed, right? I, I don't hear my even, I don't even hear my phone dinging um, if a text comes through in the middle of the night. So communication platforms are really built to be much more flexible, to be much more agile, and can be integrated with, with several other platforms and several, several other tools. So if we automate the communication and therefore we look at communication as a separate capability within DevOps, right, as part of the collaboration, as part of the communication, and as part of the integration, we will expedite engagement. Particularly during critical incidents, we'll be able to expedite decision making and we'll certainly be able to facilitate more action during critical incidents when the clock is ticking and time is really of the of the essence. So I, I hope I'm making a case that, that part of what we need to look for is unification of all of our communication capabilities. Uh, a good pal of mine says, if you think you're communicating enough, double your efforts. But don't necessarily double it in disparate ways, right? To have some type of a centralized communication platform, build a communication plan as, as IDLE and ITSM advocate, certainly understand who needs to be communicated and when. Um, and that will help you establish a communication platform that will be meaningful and will give you the types of benefits and save you the amount of time that we're trying to achieve. It's the glue, right? Most people think they communicate enough. Uh, most people think they communicate well. Most teams think they communicate with other teams well. 
But in many cases, what we consider to be good communication is not necessarily perceived that way by the recipient. And that's why dev and ops and business stakeholders and others really have to be involved in the, in the communication process <laughs> so that we understand different circumstances and we understand how and when to communicate and to whom because it is the glue that binds, right? It's the glue that's going to bind developers and operations staff. Uh, but you know, DevOps talks a lot about culture and it, it speaks a lot to collaboration and it speaks a lot to integration. But if you feel that you're, you're communicating up against a wall or the recipient is not receiving your message, um, frustration grows. And when frustration grows, aside from the obvious human aspects of it, when frustration grows, things don't happen, right? You know, people just stand still because they're not quite sure what to do. Uh, what to do next. So if we really perceive communication as probably the single most important uh, critical success factor for DevOps that even stands above automation and even stands above some of the other practices, then we recognize that, that approaching communication in a very consistent and logical way uh, makes some sense. The, the uh, final quote that sits, that sits below on this slide Without a strong communication layer across the entire organization, DevOps becomes nearly impossible to achieve. Now, that, that's a little bit of a negative message, and I'm sorry for that, but if we don't recognize that talking and texting and emailing and chat ops and all of that are all very good, but unless we've got some type of a plan in terms of how we're going to handle that, uh, again, it's not just incident management, it's change management, it's release management, it's during the, um, the, during the staging cycles or during the building and testing cycles. There's so many points in that value stream where communication is critical. And so um, certainly if things go wrong, uh, DevOps in an unplanned world, we need to make sure that communication is sound and solid and stable. Uh, but that also kind of relies on the fact that communication prior to the critical incident was sound and stable as well. So on that note, I'm going to pass this over to my friend Vincent Chevre from uh, Everbridge. And Vincent's going to uh, talk to us a little bit more about automating and streamlining communications so that we can reduce uh, business impact. Hi, Vincent. Hey, Jane. Thank you very much for this presentation and the first thing I want to say so first Jane can you hear me okay perfectly yes, okay and fine. excellent so the first thing I wanted to say is I totally agree when you said that with DevOps we are trying we want to deliver faster when things go right but also we should be uh, paying attention to what happens when things go wrong right and um, what I want to do now is talk about continue this discussion and talk about how we uh, in IT can get better at minimizing the impact of critical IT issues on the business operations. So we want to, to look at the IT issues from a business perspective and see to what extent better automated and faster communication can help. And, and for that, what I'll do in this presentation is I will give you, I will share with you eight recommendations that you, you, you may want to apply, that you can apply to resolve not only your incident faster, but also in a more consistent way. So let's get started. Okay. Um, Jane, can you, can you give me the, the, the control? I, I did. You should be able to move forward. Let me make sure. Try it again. No, you, ha you should have it. But I can move you forward for... for there we go. Right. While, while we're waiting on this, though, just a quick reminder for our listeners. Please, if you any questions based upon what Jane presented or as you're hearing Vincent's, please do use the question section of the interface, and we will get to them at the end of today's presentation. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, Jane, you should be able to click on, on giving me the control. Let's, let's try again. Okay, so if you don't mind, just, okay, so um, so what I'm, I'm going to do now is I'm going to start with a quick reminder to everybody that we've been 
going through a ongoing digital transformation, which actually has accelerated over the past 10 years. So if we can move forward, you see, and then as an example, just have a look at the evolution of the desk. This is a typical desk from the early 80s, and uh, we're just going to move forward and look at the evolution of this desk over the years. So 10 years later, and then in 2006, as you see, we are getting rid of, of a lot of stuff that we used to, to be using for uh, doing our uh, daily jobs, right? And 2016, uh, as you can see, we've pretty much got rid of everything. And today, almost everything we do as a digital component. That's the point I wanted to make here. And, um, and basically, what we see with the, this desk here has also happened in the data center. And like uh, Jane said uh, earlier, the IT department used to be a support function of the business. Then uh, later, we asked IT to align with the business. So if you remember, that's ITOL, the ITOL framework and also the best practices, which actually have helped a lot. But today, given the situation and, and how everything has been digitalized, today we can, we can even say that IT is the business. And if we agree that IT is the business, then a major IT issue is a business issue. And the question is, what, what happens when, like Jane said, things, things go wrong? So what happens when, for instance, your website goes down? Or when your application stops working? We just released a new application, guess what? We have a major issue and the application stops working. Look at, um, think about the, the customers of the service. So, and, and um, even further, bottom line, your company is going to be losing money every minute until we, in, in IT, fix the issue. And when I say uh, losing uh, money, it can be revenue loss if it's a, if it's a customer-facing application or e-commerce website, but it, also, it, it can also be a uh, drop off of the employee productivity in manufacturing, for instance, if your ERP system has an issue. Or it can be a, um, the patient safety in the hospitals being at risk because of the electronic medical record going down. So when we are in those situation of crisis, what, what happens? So usually um, we're going to receive an alert from a monitoring tool or from the, the end user, that's the time to identify. We're going to triage, categorize the issue and try to re identify who the right people uh, are to investigate the issue and to come up with a plan to fix the issue. And then after that, it's going to be the time to fix or MTTF, mean time to fix the issue, which usually doesn't take too much time. Most of the time is spent on uh, investigation. And finally, we just need to make sure that uh, what the, the, the fix we've introduced in production is not going to cause any, any other uh, trouble. And um, this is the time to resolution process as described by Forrester. So I'm using, I'm using the Forrester research, which tells us that phase number two here MTTK, mean time to know, which uh, Jane explained very well earlier, is taking up 70% of the time, the entire time that we spend fixing um, incidents, fixing issues. And what's interesting with uh, this MTTK is that the processes, the underlying processes here um, are almost never optimized and almost never automated. We see a lot of automation for the to, um, with the time to identify, automate, automated detection of issues. Time to fix can also be um, uh, automated by using release automation tools and uh, validation, so automatic testing can also help. But for the MTTK, there's not much, uh, there was up until now, not much uh, automation uh, available. And what we'll see is um, there's a lot of opportunities for us to regain a lot of the wasted time, which means, and which is going to translate for the business, um, opportunities for us to regain a lot of money for the business. And this is going to take us to the eight reasons why 
your incidents are not resolved faster. So I'm going to start with my number one. So number one recommendation, to find and eliminate unnecessary wasted time in your processes. It's, it's going to be a no-brainer for everybody, but failing to prepare to a major IT incident is preparing to fail. We have in place um, tools, uh, application performance management tools, network performance management tools, um, IT monitoring tools, and maybe some ITSM tools such as uh, ServiceNow, BMC Remedy, and so on. Uh, and this part can be automated, but when the once the ticket is created, you will still need to fix the issue. So be prepared. Have a communication play plan in place. Like Jane said before, recognize the P1s and the major incident situation. Why? Because you can't afford to, we can't afford to waste time when we're dealing with P1s and major incident situation. Because that means the business is impacted and we've got a, a significant number of um, uh, frustrated customers and end users. Number two, when something wrong uh, happens in IT and uh, we are facing a P1 or major incident, going through spreadsheet and trying to find out what team should be responsible for dealing with the, the issue and going through spreadsheet and cold trees will take a lot of time. That's unnecessary wasted time. So get all this information together into a um, and, and, and an easy way to access this information. So for any type of incident, you know what team or what teams to reach out to. And within those teams, you know exactly who's on call or who should be on call. And within, within this list, you will even know who's available. People, there, there, there's one thing to have an on-call on, on schedule, and it's another to, to know if the people are actually available. They may be sick that day, they may be on PTO that day. So um, they should have a backup uh, if they're not available. So you should have access, try to get access to this information and don't waste time. My number three recommendation, and Jane, I believe you, you, you mentioned this one earlier, emails don't wake anybody at two in the morning. And uh, I've been in many, many uh, situations where the IT issue actually happened on Sunday uh, very early in the morning. Uh, where you know nobody's in the, in the office, right? So you can't, we can't rely on just sending emails. What we want to do is ensure that you have a reliable, but also multimodal way of reaching out to people. Not only through emails, but SMS, um, mobile application push notifications, uh, text to voice, voice, and so on and so forth. Number four, if you, we've identified that to, f to work on a specific issue, it's going to take 15 people, let's say even 10 people, from people from the network operation center, from service desk, technical support, but also the network team, the DBA. We may need a, a few Java developers, um, a few people from uh, the infrastructure team and the middleware. If I'm, gonna, if, I'm, if I'm trying to, to call manually those 15 people, it's going to take me at least two to three minutes per person so that first I need to call them, reach out to them, they need to answer, I need to brief them on the type of issue, they need to agree uh, that that's something they should be looking at, and then I need to give them uh, information about how um, they're going to be able to join a conference bridge, for instance, on how they're going to be able to collaborate with the broader team. And by the way, since I need to call another 14 people, I should, I'm going to call them back in, in, in 30 minutes when once I have everybody uh, on the bridge. So it takes a lot of time. And this is, again, unnecessary wasted time. So what we want to do here is automate the reach out and, um, to, do, to those people and account for their response automatically. So we don't actually have to manually call or, um, or send emails or send SMS to those people. Number five, like we said before, using separate systems is going to create delays. If dev is using uh, uh, systems which are different from ops, if, for, for instance, if you have um, uh, APM uh, tools, monitoring tools, NPM tools, and ITSM tools, you don't want to have 
um, communication alerts or emails going out from all those those tools. Try to consolidate on one, and especially if you have an, a ticketing system, leverage your existing systems and try to make one system as your single pane of glass for IT crisis communications when it comes to reaching out to the IT resolvers, so those the IT experts who are, who are going to work on the issue, but also stakeholders and the impacted users. Number six, and this is very interesting if um, this is this may not apply if you have a, a small team and everybody is in the same building. You have uh, ops next door to uh, dev. So if you have an issue, you can uh, very quickly uh, get to to everybody on the same floor in the building. But if you have distributed uh, distributed organizations, um, like if your network operation center is in the U.S., but you have a development center in Beijing, China, or in Bangalore in India, or in Europe, how are you going to um, to reach out to those people in a timely manner? So again, these can be very time consuming. Trying to reach out to someone in Beijing at two in the morning for them can be uh, challenging sometimes. And I've been there, so I can I can tell you. Um, so ensure that whatever the communication platform you're going to be using, make sure that uh, it's going to be easy and reliable to connect to people in different countries. So make sure you have internet that's um, that's international SMS voice coverage, and that you have the the the, the, the right the correct dialing information to reach out to them. Number seven, same same idea here. Once you reach out to the people. Um, ensure that they can jump on the same conference call in one click. You don't want to, to, to have to deal with uh, local numbers for each country and sending information through email or through SMS to, to everybody. One click conference calls. You, we automatically send out a notification to 15 people, one click or press one if they receive a phone call and we are all on the same conference bridge. Number eight. And uh, this is a very important one. Again, we have a tendency, a tendency in IT once there's a major IT issue to focus on the issue and, and try to fix it as soon as we can. And, and sometimes we forget that on the other side of the wall, there's a bunch of uh, users and customers who are unhappy. And I may have my senior management uh, getting anxious because it takes too much time for IT to fix the issue. So keep, again, advice here is keep your stakeholders, so the application owners, the business owners, informed that, that we know there's an issue, IT is aware of the issue, IT is working on the issue, and we will uh, keep everybody updated automatically through uh, automated updates. So that was my number eight recommendation. And if we do that, and we've done, done this with um, um, many organizations and, and, and customers. Um, and here's what in a um, real life example you could expect. So this is a real life example with uh, working with a SaaS vendor, so a company that's delivering a service over the internet. That's the regular um, incident resolution process. And uh, as you can see, MTTR before was 162 minutes, which translated for them into a, um, a uh, cost to the business to, of $2,000 per minute. I just put, put up this slide here because I want to, to show you that um, for every organization, for any organization, it, there, there are very easy ways for you to calculate what the cost per minute to the business an IT issue is. So as you can see, the, this is a simple uh, equation here and uh, average given by Gartner says that uh, the, av the unplanned downtown cost for an organization is an average of $5,600 per minute. can be much higher if your e-commerce um, e uh, company can be lower depending on your application. For, if, for the company that I'm talking about, the estimation is uh, around 2000 per minute. And with putting in place the communication automation, they are able to cut the, the resource management phase of MTTK to 
um, 10 minutes from 45 minutes to 10 to yeah, 40, 45 minutes sorry 35 minutes to 10 minutes and um, sorry 40 minutes to 10 minutes that's 30 minutes uh, saved so for them that means there was a gain in, in terms of um, of savings of 30 minutes but also sixty thousand dollars per incident so that for this company that was huge so everything for every single incident critical incident they save an average of sixty thousand dollars so having said that um, I'm just going to give you a, a few words about uh, who we are so um, we are Everbridge IT alerting and uh, we provide a um, unified cr critical communication platform s servicing more than 2600 global customers last year in 2015 as you can see we sent out uh, more than 1 billion messaging messages uh, in more than uh, 200 countries if you want to learn more about uh, this solution about Everbridge I would invite you to visit the website italerting.com and uh, even if you don't need more information there's a uh, an easy way for you to get uh, free t-shirts uh, on this website so thank you again for your time uh, back to you Alan thank you thank you Vincent thank you very much um, it was a great great discussion great panel Jane and Vincent thank you um, unfortunately we're a little bit behind but not too much and uh, got a few questions from the audience though that I'd like to throw out both to uh, to both of you uh, first question really was a series of questions that I'm going to try to paraphrase but basically um, Jane specifically but Vincent feel free to chime in you gave out some examples of automated technology and um, you know some of the things people are doing around communication and automation and whatever bridge for instance Vincent is doing but um, can you give us some examples of who is using this kind of technology and they and is it viewed as a success if so how and I know that's a long question but I, I put together a few things so um, Jane would you like to take a crack at that first well, in terms of who's using it, I'll defer to Vincent on that because, uh, you know, clearly uh, their platform um, has been in pretty active use. I think that when we start to look at organizations that are considered to be high-performing, um, and, and again, you know, I, I, I don't want to call out one above the other, but um, DevOps.com has got a lot of great case studies on that. When we look at high-performing organizations, I think one of the critical success factors that kind of carry through everywhere is consistent communication. And, 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 and you know, and again, the term communication is such a generic term. Um, you know, I'm talking to you now, so am I communicating, you're talking to me? Um, you know, are, are we communicating? And I think that, you know, when we start to really look at what those high-performing organizations are doing, I would, I would believe that underneath it all, they have built communication matrices that really understand who needs to be contacted, right? Who needs to be contacted? Who needs to be engaged? I like the word engaged. Who needs to be engaged in, in, under particular Circumstances. So, Vincent, do you have some some more guidance on kind of who's using automated communication platforms, the kinds of organizations? Yeah, sure. And and uh, it comes it goes back to the business impact. So, the bigger the business impact for an, an, an sorry an organization, and um, the most likely that they will be looking for such a solution. So, why what do I mean by business impact? If you have a uh, company that's um, uh, delivering services or selling products over the internet to a website like Amazon.com, Netflix, those companies need to have uh, IT services, uh, need to deliver a, a class A quality of their uh, services. So any IT issue that would impact either the speed or the quality of their service is a major issue for them. So they will need to, um, to make sure that uh, the IT 
experts of the IT response team get on board ASAP, but they will also uh, want to get their stakeholders informed. So they will they, they are going to be looking at this kind of um, communication platform. Now that's that's pretty uh, easy to understand the business impact on the, for e-commerce um, uh, company. Now think about the hospitals. Hos hospitals um, over the past uh, eight years by uh, federal mandate had to go from you know paper filing to moving to um, electronic medical record. I'm pretty sure if you go to your to your uh, PCP today, uh, he's, he or she is going to log on to the, um, the computer and access your information uh, on the computer. That's what what we call a electronic medical record system or health uh, system. Guess what? When something goes wrong with those systems, again, they are you can see them as ERPs for healthcare for hospitals. Um, they don't they don't have time to um, to reach out to, to to they don't have the time to waste um, to fix the issue. If not, uh, if it takes too much time, guess what? Clinicians and staff they're going to have to go back to handwritten uh, notes and orders. And for the new generation, they, they don't they don't even know how to fill a paper based or a paper form. So it's extremely challenging, and and that can put the safety of their patient at risk. Uh, another example would be um, airlines companies. Airlines, we, we work a lot with the airline. Why? Because as soon as there's a major IT issue with their uh, computer reservation system, you know that they're going to have to ground all their planes. They won't be able to board anybody. They won't be able to to dispatch crews and uh, and so on and so forth, which is going to cause. Uh, which is going to be a big mess because they're going to have to rebook people on different uh, planes. People are going to miss connections, miss their connections. They're going to have to to issue vouchers for hotel, for food, so on and so forth. So, um, as you can see, almost every single industry now manufacturing, manufacturing. If you if the supply chain application has an issue, that means the manufacturing floor is going to be stopped. That means you're not producing the goods that you're supposed to produce. That means your customers are not going to be delivered on time, and so on and so forth. So, the bigger again, the bigger the business impact, and most likely that they, the, the the management in those companies are going to be paying attention very closely to what IT is doing. Very good. Did I answer your question? Yeah. I, I think you did a nice job there. Um, so another question we've got, and again, uh, a little, I'm going to have to paraphrase it a little bit, but uh, you know, this seems more this type of solution seems more ops orientated. But how can developers improve if they've been working DevOps? It looks mostly to be more for support kind of issue. And and Vincent and Jane, before you jump in, you know, let me earn my dollars here and, and jump in here quickly as well. You know, one of the I, I think one of the great things about DevOps teams, whether you have a DevOps name in your title is immaterial. If you're working in a cross functional team where you have people who are developers and ops, QA security, other people, all as part of one cross functional team, that this type of communication, this type of response you know how many times have I, companies I've started where my customer support engineer my ops people said geez I, I don't know this looks to be a, I need the developer who did the code to look at this and instead of having to escalate you know to level two three and four and my wait escalate wait times go from 24 to 72 to more hours you know one of the beautiful things about DevOps is these these short feedback loops and not having to escalate level four to the developer for 72 hours later. So I, I think I think there's no reason developers aren't part of this whole uh, alerting system. But that being said, Vincent, you're the expert on Everbridge. I'll let you answer it. Yeah, so what I, uh, what I want to say, what I want to add to what you just said, Alan, is um, developers have to be in those um, escalation uh, processes. And um, DevOps is great, and but remember that people are not waiting to receive an email or to receive a notification that something's going wrong. They are busy doing working on real business project, 
projects, right? And um, and Ops is also working on uh, making the the system stable and so on and so forth. So everybody's busy and unplanned issues. There's no one waiting for an unplanned issue. So when it happens, you still need to identify who are the right developers to come and help. Who are the right uh, resources in network in in uh, DBAs. Um, to, to help investigate. And in the meantime, if there is no communication uh, system in place, who's going to think about the impacted customers? Think about the impacted customers. Who's going to be uh, responsible or who's going to be uh, thinking about how do I communicate with my customers? Let's say you are a SaaS provider. You provide a uh, B2B services through SaaS. If something goes wrong with your platform, you may need to, um, to update your customers because you may have SLAs in place and especially when you have SLAs in place. Uh, we're working with organizations where they have SLAs with the, um, the IT department on, to, to, um, uh, to, to, on when, up, up until when they can join a conference call. For example, they have, uh, if you have an issue that requires a third party vendor to be uh, involved, uh, you may have organizations, some organizations have um, SLAs where it says the third party vendor has to jump on the, the call within the 10 minutes after they receive the notification. So how do you ensure this? How do you track that your provider is actually uh, delivering based on the SLA that you, you have in, in, in place? So it's not a, uh, a tool for ops, it's not a tool for dev, it's not a tool for um, uh, technical support, it's really a a tool for, for a team, for a team in IT uh, who is going to be collaborating on fixing an issue and therefore reducing the, the impact on the business. And That's how I see it. And, and I'm just going to jump in just real fast on that because I think it's a great question and I'm not going to belabor this much longer, but um, I think historically that's why communication is such a challenge, is that we see it as an ops responsibility where dev is much more passive in the process. So they're either the recipients or sometimes the victims, right, of communication because they weren't engaged in the communication process all along. So I would hope that in, in a DevOps environment, um, dev is an active participant in communication and that they help to author the rules and they help to identify what um, what they can, should, how, when, if, should do, do, and they're not just the recipients of the communication because I think that that just doesn't change anything um, as we're moving forward. We want DevOps to develop communication plans together. I totally agree with you, Jane. Okay. Um, Couple of, ooh, we're over the time limit. I, I have a couple of other questions, Vincent, I'm going to have to send to you, but it's not fair. People log in for an hour and we promise them an hour. Uh, they need to, they have work to do. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to need to end this one right here, but we do have your questions. We will get them to Vincent and Jane and we will try to, to get answers for you. Until then though, Jane, Vincent, great job, great webinar. Thank you so much, Everbridge, for sponsoring. Most of all, thank all of you for, for participating today. We hope you found it useful. This is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com, and we'll see you on our next webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.